Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Helwig from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I'll um, remind folks that we're going to uh, uh, try to keep uh, folks muted. If you have um, any uh, reactions or comments, please feel free to add them to the chat. Uh, if you do have questions, we'd ask you to add those to the shared notes document and we will um, add those, address those later as time allows. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Tobin Archer from the University of uh, South Dakota and uh, Julianne Gribbevold from GIP Richia from, um, uh, from France, who are going to be our two speakers today. Go ahead, uh, Tobin. Alrighty. So today I will be presenting on the build pipeline that we have we use here at USD to do cloud-based buildings of our portal. I would say this is a way of accomplishing this. I would not say it is the best way. It's just a way of accomplishing this. So first, a quick side note: Azure DevOps versus DevOps. Azure DevOps is a product. It's a platform by Microsoft for doing DevOps on. DevOps is a set of practices that combines parts of de development with parts of operations. I'll be talking mostly about Azure DevOps today, but you can use this as inspiration for how to do your DevOps pipelines as well. So first off, what is Azure DevOps good for? As with many things, it's good for gathering the disparate parts of the project, the code repository, the artifact registry, and the build infrastructure. The code repositories in Azure are now Git. Thankfully, Microsoft has surrendered on this point and we don't have to use TFS anymore. Well, <laughs> thankfully. Um, the artifact registry, this is a piece that might you might not have had to use previously. We all have little uh, custom portlets and things like that, which we use at our university. When you're building on your local machine or on your, your owned machines, this isn't usually a problem because you can just install the packages on the machine that's doing the build. However, when you're building in the cloud, those machines will not have those packages installed. So you must set up a artifact registry. Setting up a whole server to do that is kind of annoying. So fortunately, Azure DevOps has a tool for has a built-in Maven registry and Grail registry, a couple others so that you have, can have all those packages centralized in one place so that other people and the build process can access them for doing the build. And lastly, there's the build pipeline part of this, which is what I'm going to spend most of this, of this talk on. The, it detects when changes have been made, it rebuilds the packages, and then makes them available for other parts of the system to do releases and other builds. So this is a quick glance at the, the tiny change I'm going to make. I'm just going to change the, the version of one of our portlets up at, a, up at a version and then commit and push that change. And just like that, it starts a build automatically. Um, this is a quick glance of the whole build process. It will be more easy to see if you download the, but I'm going to step into each part separately to see how this works. First off is the trigger. This is just a Git branch. When it detects a push to a specific Git branch, it will trigger the build process. In our case, that's USD. You could do this with multiple things if you wanted to. Like you could have a different build pipeline for dev and a different build pipeline for production. We use the same Docker image for dev and production, so we just build it once and deploy it in multiple locations. This just tells it what to use for doing the actual build process. Next is a important note for any of you out there who might be using in common for your certificate authority. Azure, the images that Azure uses for building do not recognize in common as a CA cert, uh, does not recognize it as a certificate authority. So you will, may have to do something like this in order to get your build pipeline to work correctly if you are interacting with your local servers, which is one of the tricks that I will show you later. It's kind of annoying, but 
it works. That's the important thing. <laughs> this, this, you can get it to work. Just a heads up to those of you who use in common. Next, it does the actual build process. This is pretty understandable. It calls Gradle U with Tomcat Deploy and creates the actual software that is going to be deployed as the portal. Then is this is where the in common certificate comes into play. The container registry here at USD is secured, of course, with an in common certificate. And so without that previous step, it was unable to push to our registry. So now that I've inserted the, the intermediate certificate into the build pipeline, it can actually connect to our registry, then it does the build and it pushes a new Docker container to our registry for, for use in the release process, which I want to comment at this point, at least in Azure, they think uh, they have two types of build pipelines. I have been referring to one as the build pipeline and the other as the release pipeline. Build pipelines tend to be focused on creating artifacts, whether that's an image or a package or something of that nature. Release pipelines tend to be more focused on creating uh, effects in your environment. So the package has been built. Now let's push it to dev, let's push it to prod, et cetera. And so that's the next step here is the release pipeline. The first step here, this box notes that, hey, a new image has been released into the um, into the container registry. So it triggers the release pipeline. And the first step of the release pipeline is, of course, to push it to development. Here is where I had to do a bit of a clever hack. Um, so in order to get this to work, I had to treat each of our development servers as separate deployment pools and it deploys to one and then it deploys to the other. This is, of course, not how it's supposed, you're supposed to do this, but this allowed me to take a piece-by-piece -piece approach to this problem. Instead of going all on-premises and then suddenly all in the cloud, I have a build pipeline that is all in the cloud with servers that are still running exactly the way they have been. I would like to get them to the point where they're orchestrated, but we're not there yet. And so this this little hack allows me to take a take bits out of the problem one at a time, rather than having to wait for all of the stars to align for the process to move forward. It something that I hope to replace with a more proper method later. But the important thing is it worked and it got the process running. Then it waits for approval from me. So I go into the dev portal and I check and like, yep, the things that I have done are exactly how I want them approved. And it goes on to regression testing. If it fails any of those, it sends it back to me. Otherwise, it progresses on to marketing eventually. Oh, this is still a little bit of a proof of concept, but it's a proof of concept that we actually use to do our, at least the development deployments. Um, at this point, I contact marketing, they check it and it comes back and then, they, and then I approve it. But that's just a minor detail that will be sorted eventually. The, once marketing approves it, then it pushes it out to production. The really cool part about this is where was I doing the interactions? I had to create the change and I had to, I create, I created the change and I pushed it and then I had to approve it. So I had to interact beforehand, the actual development work. And then I just had to give a sanity check later. The rest of this process is fully automated, which frees up a lot of headspace because the actual deployment process, of course, takes a week and a half. I have to get approval from this person. I have to get approval from that person. This takes care of all of those approval processes and the actual push to production. So I can just focus on what I need to be doing. So the next steps with this would be to finish the release pipeline, get it to actually work with marketing, get it to actually do the final production push, which you know has to happen at appropriate times and things like that. And then change the system to work with a hosted Docker sort of solution, um, perhaps a clustering option like Kubernetes. 
And once that is done, we can remove four servers from our environment. And that's why I put the little comment in there about profit of that is time that our server, our operations team does not have to think about those servers. They don't have to run backups. They don't have to store them. They don't have to care for the VMs. That is a bunch of work off of their shoulders so that they can do other, other more important things. So lessons learned from this. One, you don't need to move from on-premises to cloud in one step. I have set up a pretty thorough hybrid environment with parts of it are on the cloud and parts of it are on-premises. And I did this intentionally so that we could evolve our system to get to where it, we want it to be. I've taken to this mantra lately of the evolutionary and not revolutionary because I'd much rather have 10 successful tiny steps than one failure. So it, it's, you don't have to do everything all at once. Figure out how you can break things down into smaller chunks and have tackle those even if you have to use clever hacks. Lastly, shiny tools do not remove the need for creativity, despite what marketing may tell you. I will admit that our environment, uh, as I have it set up here, is a bit unique, but who among you does not have a unique environment in some way or another? You are going to have to be creative with what you are given in order to get it to work, which isn't a bad thing. Just know that the cloud, as you've probably heard, does not fix all problems. It just changes them into different problems. Any questions? I see something in shared notes. Feel free to add your questions here. I don't see any questions. Oh, we can add I questions see a Benito typing. As well. Sounds good. So post your questions in the shared notes and I'll answer them after uh, Julian talks. You are now presenter, Julian. Hi folks. So um, it will be less uh, technical. I will uh, present uh, mainly my context as I'm in a particular context. Um, I'm uh, a developer, DevOps engineer uh, from uh, the, a new team uh, of um, my uh, organization uh, based mainly on open source software. So uh, before um, I will present you uh, my context, it's uh, really particular. Uh, Mainly because uh, GIP is uh, in English, English GPI, group of uh, public interest. Uh, that means that uh, we are uh, uh, a group of uh, public organizations that are her members, and uh, we are uh, we have missions uh, from them. So uh, we don't act as we want, and uh, we do only what they want. Um, so uh, our missions are around mainly educational uh, parts, but uh, not only. We, uh, we are managing uh, services uh, for, for public administrations, but uh, for some projects, it's uh, also uh, only relationships and uh, digital economic development uh, for enterprise. And the main part is uh, we are uh, a ZIP portal member. The more interesting part. Um, we are limited on uh, an area because uh, it's only a region uh, from France, but uh, with uh, several uh, community, uh, we are we have a region with uh, departments and uh, other some sub areas, uh, and each uh, areas can be a member of our organization and can uh, provide us some missions around digital. 
Um, our team is a compound uh, with only three people uh, since a long time now. And uh, we deploy uh, several uh, educational services for uh, height and middle schools of our uh, area. But uh, since the COVID, it changed a lot uh, due to intensive uh, use of uh, educational uh, services. And uh, we have new missions. Uh, so uh, we are recruiting. Um, about uh, UPortal. Uh, so as we can see, it makes a long time that uh, we are deploying it. But uh, we uh, we need to to make uh, some change during uh, all the all the years to uh, to uh, to to uh, to have a better response to uh, use of our population. Uh, and uh, the main moment where when uh, we uh, we make a studying user comportment. Uh, it uh, proof it, it make a proof that uh, we need uh, to evolve uh, to make evolutions on the UI for uh, for uh, our publics and uh, only with a such change we increase of uh, thirty percent the use of the of all our services mainly on U portal. And uh, since COVID, we we had uh, we have a lot of requests and uh, expansion to move to do. Um, so to talk about uh, the new UI, it's uh, uh, the result of the study. Uh, the DLM logic uh, was not for every people also. And uh, can, can, it can be maintained by uh, everyone. Uh, even if uh, a school have an administrator, it's, uh, it was uh, too much uh, for them to, uh, to maintain such thing. After, um, people uh, need a really simple screens and uh, possibilities uh, for actions. So, uh, Another part was on the end of the tabs and fly, fly out menu, menu uh, because uh, it's a uh, logic of uh, the people who made it only. So uh, we, uh, we, we made some choice about that. Um, in the, in the, sorry. Um, we have uh, some requirements like uh, providing uh, uh, better school identities and uh, easy ways to, uh, to, to find uh, or discover services into the portal. After, uh, we have some technical requirements like uh, avoiding to uh, modify uh, your portal sources. So uh, that's why we uh, we build we build the ESCO content menu menu. Um, so um, the COVID uh, increase uh, our uh, our uh, project needs. Uh, as examples, uh, we have only uh, some uh, schools. Uh, before the COVID, and uh, incre it increased a lot after. So during the one year, we uh, nearly we increase of uh, the double the the number of uh, accounts. Um, and also we have uh, a request to deploy our portal systems uh, for uh, primary schools and 
in the, the, on the same way, we have a request for uh, public administrations. So uh, just to say that we are a simple architecture. Uh, the, the context is particular because uh, we have uh, one domain name per uh, community. It's a uh, willing of uh, our uh, managers, deciders, political managers, uh, to have uh, their uh, sign. Um, so uh, more technically, after we have uh, Asha proxy as a load balancer. Before we have uh, Apache, uh, but uh, due to uh, load, uh, heavy load, we uh, we have some pro we had some problems with uh, with it. So uh, we migrate to Asha proxy. And after you, we have only uh, five U portal instance in load balancing for all uh, for all. Um, we are managing, uh, we, we don't use tenant system, but uh, we are managing all by groups. And uh, for that, we, uh, we use a, a grouper UI from Internet de Consortium. Um, all groups uh, managed, uh, managed into grouper are published into uh, the, our OpenLDAP directory. And uh, into your portal, we use uh, the smart LDAP uh, groups system. Um, just some uh, stats about uh, COVID. So uh, I provided uh, some references uh, before the first uh, lockdown and uh, uh, and after with the context uh, increase, increasing. Um, the, um, at the first lockdown, we see that uh, we increase a lot uh, user access uh, from 2 million to 5 million with nearly uh, only few users uh, coming. But uh, after, uh, uh, adding new schools, uh, we get uh, progressively more users. And um, as we can see, uh, we uh, uh, the use uh, increase even without uh, new users. So it permit uh, the COVID permit uh, to uh, to to increase uh, digital use. Of our services. Um, so no, uh, I will uh, show you how the Esco uh, content menu seems. Uh, I will share my screen. If uh, Uh, this should be this one. Yes. It's coming. Yes. Okay. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, several skins per uh, domain for the guest user. Every uh, community have a presentation page. After connection, I will show you the how it looks like. So um, the welcome page is a mainly a communication page uh, where users uh, will uh, find uh, several uh, uh, channels of communications with some tips. And uh, here we have our ESCO content menu that uh, provide all user services. Uh, we have um, 
uh, on the left, uh, the school identity with uh, a picture. Uh, behind, uh, you have the user identity with an uh, avatar. It permits uh, to users to uh, to uh, to uh, customize their environment. Also, they have their favorites. They can add and remove easily favorites. And uh, we can navigate easily uh, into uh, all uh, available services. And you have a filter for that. And that's all. Oh, yes. Uh, you have a different uh, way to, uh, to show uh, portlets. You have the um, high definition with a card and the small definition like uh, it's done in favorites. OK. I think that uh, I made the old things. So do you have any questions? Uh, thank you to uh, both Julian and uh, Tobin. Um, if folks do have questions uh, at this point, uh, you can add them to the shared notes or the chat and we'll uh, capture them. Um, Julian, do you, um, does your team manage all of, um, the creation of the um, of the content, you know, and the um, mm. saying yes. which 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 population gets which content. That's all uh, centrally managed by you, your team. Okay, um, we have uh, at se several levels. We provide. Uh, maybe I can show you. Uh, uh, how it works with a uh, grouper. Uh, users have, uh, this one is uh, an administrator. Uh, so an administrator have uh, group level uh, administration available. He can uh, add users uh, to a group to provide accesses to the to an application um, it's for a school level so uh, some applications are configurable on by this way um, at a more global level we have some uh, mandatory applications that we configure um, and a school can't add a new uh, service uh, without asking uh, us. But uh, it's in the case that the service is not integrated. So uh, we provide uh, a list of services by default to all schools. So it depends. Uh, we have a grouper systems. We are using um, bags groups also to filter uh, to, uh, to the school because a user can be on several schools. So um, as you can see on the top, we ha you have the, the name of the school. And uh, for this user here, you have uh, a switch button that permit him to select another school. So with the specific bags, you can filter uh, the services for a school uh, depending on the user 
selected uh, school. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. Um, I, again, I appreciate Tobin and Julian. Uh, thank you for uh, the quick um, overviews. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, I do invite uh, uh, people, um, I think coming up in a lightning talk, Ju Julian is going to be showing off some additional web components. And um, I invite you to attend the uPortal roadmap community meeting on Thursday. And um, if you're interested in contributing, there's a uPortal contribution work workshop on Friday. Thank you again.